Welcome to AQA GCSE Chemistry Topic 7 Organic Chemistry Crude Oil, Hydrocarbons and Alkanes Crude oil is a finite resource that means that one day we will run out and it's found in rocks Crude oil is the remains of ancient biomass consisting mainly of plankton and zooplankton which are ancient sea creatures approximately 340 million years ago that died but did not decompose because they were covered in sand and silt. Over time, in these anaerobic conditions, under the heat and pressure of the sand and silt and rock above them, it was turned into crude oil, which is a mixture of a very large number of compounds. Most of the compounds in crude oil are hydrocarbons. A hydrocarbon is a molecule that's made up of hydrogen and carbon atoms only. And this is a two mark question in the exams and you get one mark for saying it's a molecule made up of hydrogen and carbon and you get the second mark for the word only. So remember to include the word only in your definition. Now most of the hydrocarbons in crude oil are alkanes. And the general formula for the homologous series of alkanes is CNH2N plus 2. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now the word homologous means, homo means same. So they have the same general formula. As, uh, but logus series means that they differ by every time CH2. So they have same, similar properties, similar chemical and physical properties that differ slightly. Now you need to know the first four members of the alkane family. That's methane, ethane, propane, butane. And a mnemonic that we remember that is Mary eats peanut butter. M-E-P-B. Now there's two ways of representing alkanes, either using the molecular formula, which is the number of hydrogens and carbons in the alkane, and remember, we, we represent the number of atoms that are chemically joined as a subscript. So in the case of methane, we have one carbon and four hydrogens. Or we can represent it as displayed, and that's showing the covalent bonds present. Now, carbon's in group four, so it has four electrons in its outermost shell, and it shares those four electrons. If you need to review this, go back and look at dot cross diagrams and um, simple covalent molecules in topic two. And we can see that we have the one, two, three, four paired of, um, pairs of electrons showed as single lines. Now the next in the family is ethane. That has two carbons and it has six hydrogens. Now the difference between these two is CH2. And we can actually see that from the diagram that to make ethane we remove the hydrogen we add on a C and two hydrogens, and then we add that hydrogen back on. So the display, displayed formula differs by a CH2. And this goes on in a logical series. So propane has three carbons and eight hydrogens. And as we can see, it's got, we take off the hydrogen, we put on a carbon and two hydrogens, and then we place back on the hydrogen, so we've added CH2. And the pattern continues with butane differs by C and two hydrogens, and then we've taken off a hydrogen, added a C and H2, and added another hydrogen on again. And so it continues on and on and on, but you only need to know the name, formula, and displayed formula for the first four alkanes. And you can see that for every carbon, there is two hydrogens, hence C, N, H2, and at the ends, we have to put on two hydrogens, so it's CnH2n plus 2. Fractional distillation in petrochemicals. Now many hydrocarbons in crude oil are separated into fractions, each of which contains molecules that are a similar number of carbon atoms. And the process we do this is fractional distillation, taking a whole, that's the whole mixture of crude oil, and separating it into parts or fractions. And the process we do this is called distillation which is by evaporating a mixture, heating it up to 400 degrees C in a furnace so that it turns to a gas, and then entering a column, a condensing column, where it's hot at the bottom, 
approximately 350 degrees C and cold at the top, approximately 25 degrees C. Now as the mixture enters in, the gases will rise until they reach the point in which they turn, they get cool enough and they condense and turn back into a liquid where they're trapped and taken off. So fractions can then be processed to, to produce fuels and feedstocks for the petrochemical industry. Now many of the fuels on which we depend are modern lifestyle, such as petrol for cars, kerosene, the American um, is the American name for paraffin, fuel oil, which is used to heat buildings and large ships, liquefied petroleum gases, which are used for heating and cooking, and in Bunsen burners are all produced from crude oil. Many useful materials that life depends on can be made from these, such as solvents, lubricants, polymers and detergents. Now the vast array of natural and synthetic carbon compounds occur due to the ability of carbon atoms to form families of similar compounds. We've already seen one called the alkanes. Properties of hydrocarbons. Some properties of hydrocarbons depend on the size of the molecule, the boiling point. So as we see here, I put the fractions in order from the top of the column, the refinery gases, and to gasoline is what the Americans call petrol, naphtha, which is a, the feedstock for the petrochemical industry. So we put those two fractions together there. Kerosene, which remember is also called uh, paraffin in the UK, diesel, lubrication oil, fuel oil, bitumen. And you can see that the first fraction has carbons one to four, methane, ethane, propane and butane. And then next we have C5 to 10, which is petrol, kerosene 10 to 16, diesel 14 to 20, lubrication oil 20 to 50, which also includes fuel oil, which is quite heavy, 20 to 70, and bitumen or tar, which has 70 or more carbons in. So each fraction has a specific size of alkane within it. Now, it wouldn't surprise you to know that refinery gases, which come out of the column, have a low boiling point because they're already gases at room temperature. They must have a low boiling point. And if you have a look at the other extreme, we've got tar, which we use on roads, has incredibly high boiling point. Viscosity. Viscosity is the measure of how runny something, something is or how much they stick to each other. Now, if you think about refinery gases are called gases by definition. The particles do not touch, so they flow easily. And gases are fluid, so therefore they are not viscous. They are very much less viscous than the opposite, which is tar, which is very sticky or viscous. So viscosity increases as you go down the column. Flammability, one of the reasons, well, the, a lot of hydrocarbons are used as fuels, but if we think of how easily it is able to light methane gas out of a Bunsen compared to tar used on roads, the trend of flammability is that they become easier to light or more flammable as we go up the column. That is, that the carbon length decreases. So to repeat, boiling point increases with carbon chain length. Viscosity increases with carbon chain length. Flammability decreases with increasing chain length. These properties are influenced on the uses of them as fuels. Properties of hydrocarbons. The combustion of hydrocarbon releases energy. Fuel plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water in complete combustion. During combustion, the carbon in the hydrogen fuels are oxidised. Carbon becomes carbon dioxide and the water becomes H2O. Now you saw a demonstration of uh, testing for the products of combustion in the lab. In this uh, diagram, we have a candle which is made of wax, which is made from hydrocarbon. It's being combusted and using a vacuum pump, the waste gases from combustion are being sucked along this tube into this U-tube. And this U-tube is cooled by an ice and water bath where the water produced by combustion cools and condenses 
and can be tested using either anhydrous copper sulfate, which is white and will turn blue in the presence of water, or copper chloride paper, which will also turn blue. The carbon dioxide is also tested as it's sucked through the tube that goes into lime water, and lime water turns cloudy in the presence of carbon dioxide. Cracking and alkenes. Hydrocarbons can be broken down or cracked to produce smaller, more useful molecules. Cracking is where long chain alkanes, for example octane, is broken down into shorter alkanes, like hexane, and an alkene, such as ethene. Cracking can be done by various methods. Two methods include catalytic cracking, so you've probably seen in a lab where we use broken porous pot as the catalyst, and as the paraffin moves over the hot porous pot, it breaks into a shorter alkane and an alkene, and it passes down the delivery tube and is collected over water. Or, alternatively, it can be cracked using steam. The conditions used for catalytic cracking are heat or steam. The products of cracking include alkanes and another type of hydrocarbon called alkenes. Alkenes are more reactive than alkanes and react with bromine water, which is used as a test for alkenes. Bromine water is orange, as you can see in the photo, and when reacted with an alkene, it will decolorize because the bromine adds to the alkene to make a bromoalkane in which the double bond breaks and the single bond between the two bromines breaks and the two molecules add together. Because the orange bromine is now reacted and, and no longer in existence, the colour, the, the bromine which made the solution orange is now gone. We would say that it decolorises the bromine water. There is a high demand for fuels with small molecules such as petrol and diesel and for some of the products of cracking are useful as fuels. In this graph here we can see that the demand in green for gases used for heating and cooking, petrol used for cars, diesel also used for cars and lorries, far exceeds the supply available. However, in the case of kerosene and fuel oil we can see that there is a greater supply than demand and we can meet the demand for shorter alkanes by breaking the longer chain alkanes using cracking. Now modern life depends on the uses of these hydrocarbons. Another use of alkenes produced by um, cracking is to produce polymers. For example, ethene can make polyethene. Now have a go at this past paper question. Describe a test that shows that molecules of propene contain a carbon to carbon double bond. Can you remember what the test was and what the result was? What you should have said is the test was bromine water and that bromine water turns from orange to colourless or decolorises. Careful, don't say clear if you mean colourless because the two words do not mean the same thing. Part D. Propene can be made by cracking fractions obtained from crude oil. This equation shows the cracking of decane to produce propene and butane. If the total mass of products formed is 17 grams, sorry, if 17 grams of decane has been cracked, what's the total mass of all products formed? And the answer is 17. Remember, in the previous video we looked at the law of conservation of mass. Total mass of reactants equals the total mass of products. Structure and formula of alkenes. Now this is only applies to students on the chemistry GCSE. Alkenes are hydrocarbons with a carbon-carbon double bond. The general formula for alkenes is CnH2n as opposed to CnH2n plus 2 for alkanes. This is because the two bonds at the ends of the alkanes have been broken to make the single, the, the double bond for the carbon-carbon double bond. Also, a lot of students put lots of um, double bonds in an alkene, and at GCSE, remember, alkenes only have one double bond. Alkene molecules are unsaturated because they contain two fewer hydrogen atoms than alkane with the same number of carbon bonds. 
Now, just like alkanes, you need to know al the first uh, for alkenes. Sorry, this should be uh, an E for alkenes, as in the title slide. The first one is ethene, C2H4, in the displayed formula as follows. Propene, C3H6, butene, C4H8, and pentene, C5H10. Do you know why there isn't a methene? If you said that an alkene must have a carbon-carbon double bond and therefore the smallest one is ethene, you were right. Another careful note is when you're drawing the displayed formula, many students like to put a hydrogen here so it looks, uh, so the gaps fill. But remember, carbon only makes four bonds. So always make sure that carbon doesn't make more or less than four bonds. So we've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on, okay? Reactions of alkenes, and again, this is chemistry only. Alkenes react with oxygen in combustion reactions in the same way as other hydrocarbons, but they tend to burn in air with smoky flames because of incomplete combustion. Ethene plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. Ethene and oxygen would make carbon monoxide and water incomplete combustion. Alkenes react with hydrogen by the addition of atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond. So the carbon-carbon the double bond and not the single bond breaks and the bond in the molecule that's adding to it breaks so that we end up with these two bonds being formed. Now in this reaction, which is called hydrogenation, and alkene and hydrogen react to form ethane. The reaction conditions are a nickel catalyst at 150 degrees Celsius. Alkenes also react with water by the addition of atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond so that the carbon-carbon double bond becomes a single bond. The reaction conditions for this are an acid catalyst such as phosphoric acid 300 degrees C and high pressure, 60 atmospheres. Alkenes react with the halogen, as we've seen before, by the addition of the halogen across the carbon-carbon double bond. So it becomes a single bond, and we make two bonds with the bromine. And this occurs with bromine at room temperature. The reaction is the same if you use chlorine and iodine. Alcohols. Alcohols contain the functional group OH, so the smallest group is methanol, where we've taken off a H, taken the E off methane, replaced it with an OH, and called the methanol. Similarly with the molecular formula, we take one H off and replace it with an OH. Then we have ethanol, propanol, butanol. Again, like alkanes and alkenes, they differ by CH2. You need to know the following reactions of alcohols. Alcohols plus sodium makes a sodium alkoxide and hydrogen. For example, methanol plus sodium would make uh, sodium methoxide and hydrogen. Alcohols plus oxygen make carbon dioxide and water. For example, ethanol plus oxygen make carbon dioxide and water. And alcohols generally burn better than alkanes because they contain oxygen already. The main use of alcohols are in drinks mainly, eth well, only ethanol, fuels and solvents. Aqueous solutions of ethanol for drinking are produced through fermentation when sugar solutions are fermented using yeast at 37 degrees Celsius. Carboxylic acids, again, chemistry only. They have the functional group COOH. The smallest uh, carboxylic acid contains one carbon, so therefore it's COOH with just one other hydrogen on. Then methanoic acid, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid, and butanoic acid. So we have the same prefixes, meth, eth, prop, but, to indicate the number of carbons. And then we have the functional group, oic acid at the end. Similarly, we have it in the way that we write the displayed formula. There's our functional group, and then we're just adding CH2 each time. Carboxylic acids 
react with a metal carbonate to make salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. For example, ethanoic acid would make sodium carbonate, sodium ethanoate, water and carbon dioxide. Carboxylic acids can also react with alcohols to make esters used for flavouring and fragrances. For example, ethanoic acid plus ethanol would make ethyl, which is, takes its name from the alcohol, and then ethanoate and water. In this reaction, the hydrogen from the alcohol and the OH from the carboxylic acids combine to make water and the oxygen joins with the carbon from the carboxylic acid. Addition polymerization. Alkenes we can use to make polymers such as polyethene, polypropene by addition polymerization. The alkenes combine and the carbon-carbon double bond breaks and they join up. In addition polymerization, many small molecules called monomers join together to form a very large molecule called a polymer. We can these chains are very, very, very long, so we can um, describe the repeating unit as the same atoms as the monomer, but no other molecule is formed. So in here, remember, in the, in the, the repeating unit, we draw the carbon-carbon single bond, with the bonds formed are going left and right, going out of the brackets. We also put the ends to represent the number of repeating units in the chain in the bottom right-hand corner. We take the name of the monomer, ethene, and we put it in brackets, and then we write the word poly in front. So many ethene monomers will form a large polyethene chain. The simplest repeating unit is given here. Condensation polymerization. Condensation polymerization involves monomers with two functional groups. For example, a di-carboxylic acid and a di-ol. The di represents two. When these types of monomers react together, they usually lose a small molecule, such as water. This is why they're called condensation polymers. Amino acids. Amino acids have the general formula NH2, which is the amino group, CHR, and R could represent uh, CH3 or H or another carboxylic acid or another amine group. There's lots of different options there, but they all have a carboxylic acid group here, hence amino acid. Amino acids react together by condensation polymerization to produce polypeptides. In, in the reaction, the OH from the carboxylic acid reacts with a H from the amino group, much like we had earlier in polyesters to form a polyamino acid chain or protein. Now DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is a large molecule essential for life. The DNA encodes genetic instructions for the development and functioning of living organisms and viruses. The most DNA molecules are two polymer chains made from four different monomers called nucleotides, adenine, thiamine, guanine, cytosine and they're joined on a phosphate backbone. And these two long protein chains are attracted to a, uh, one another and form what's called a double helix structure. Other examples of naturally occurring polymers include cellulose, used in the cell walls of plant cells, starch, used to store glucose molecules, and proteins, um, that are amino acids joined together.